Hey there, commanders. So, check this out. This is my War Ox Type 10 build, which I've debuted in a previous video. And today what I wanted to do was focus on an aspect of the game that goes a little bit deeper than just shields and armor, and that is hull internals, or the modules that you have in your optional slot. Uh, hard points and utility mounts and core internals, they all count under this category. But these are the essential systems inside your ship that augment its performance. And one of the aspects of gameplay that you have to deal with, especially as you get into PvP, is the concept of targeting these individual modules within a ship in order to impart some negative consequence on the commander flying it. When in combat in Elite Dangerous, you have to plan around people trying to mess with you in subtle but significant ways. In PvP, for example, one of the most common targets to shoot out is the power plant. While this Type 10 possesses over 6,000 absolute hull points, if your power plant isn't well armored, then this number is completely meaningless. Because once your shields are down, and on the Type 10 there's really not a lot you can do to get shields, then the integrity of your power plant becomes the primary point of weakness for your entire ship build, as does your thrusters, as does other elements like your life support. It's very important to understand these weaknesses and to do what you can to try to address them and patch them up as best you can. In the case of the War Ox, for example, since maneuverability is not on my side and just about any medium ship can take prime positioning to shoot out my power plant, I've had to take extra measures to plan for that weakness and have opted for an 8B rather than an 8A power plant so that I could proc the maximum base integrity possible. The game offers you a couple of systems to try to protect your internals from damage. I've mentioned shields, I've mentioned reinforced blueprints. These are uh, any blueprint really that shields or reinforces a module's integrity. The game offers you two, uh, two approaches to engineering greater module integrity, one through shielded and one through armored. Uh, power plants offer you armored. Um, FSDs, for example, offer you shielded. And then there are other things like your AFM, which you can go in and you can also shield. The difference between these two is that a shielded reinforcement where it's offered will not increase the module's mass, but will dramatically increase its power draw. And armored will not usually affect power draw, but will affect module mass. In the case of the Type 10, I opted to just take the armored blueprints wherever they were offered, because I don't really care how heavy the Type 10 is. It's a chunky boy, and you're not really ever going to make it viable in combat maneuvering, so you might as well just make her heavy. There is a third option, and one that's often poorly understood by the community, and that one is located right down here. The module Reinforcement Package. The game has a couple of different variations of this reinforcement. Um, one is the standard module reinforcement, and the other is the Guardian module reinforcement down here. This is one of the only internals in the game that cannot be engineered, which I suppose I could understand in practice, but it would be nice to see some ways to augment the module's performance. Module reinforcements are a great way to protect internals where the shielded or reinforced blueprints are not the best option. I, for example, uh, have a weapon-focused grade 5 power distributor, uh, and that leaves a slight opening to attack. Uh, with 144 integrity, it wouldn't take very much damage to start malfunctioning this module and eventually to disable it. Sensors are another common weakness, as it's one of the only core internals that does not offer a reinforced or shielded blueprint. When you fire a weapon in Elite Dangerous, its DPS goes through a series of calculations, the first being damage falloff. A weapon outside of its optimal range, in this case a half a kilometer, will suffer a degradation in its damage output up into its maximum range, which in this case is six kilometers. Since I'm using the focus blueprint and not the long-range blueprint, that's, uh, it's a pretty consistent falloff. Now, um, if that weapon strikes shields, the damage falloff is calculated first, and then the damage to the shields is calculated uh, based on the resistance of the shield. So, in this case, 9.5 DPS, we'll just round it up to 10 for the sake of easy math. Damage falloff is calculated first, and then when the impact strikes the shield, what damage is left of that 10 gets pushed through these ratios here, based on the damage type, in this case thermal, there would be a 37.7% reduction in damage output, which would give it somewhere around 7 total DPS, assuming that the impact happened inside of 0.5 kilometers. If it happens outside, then uh, this calculation would be based on the remainder of damage 
um, after falloff is applied. If the target's hull is exposed, then another series of calculations take place. And in the case of a pulse laser, the first calculation that gets made is to compare the hull hardness. Uh, so falloff gets hit and then hull hardness. Hull hardness takes off a certain amount of damage based on the piercing value of your weapons. In this case, I'm using a focus blueprint. This weapon would not suffer any loss in damage output due to hull hardness because its piercing value exceeds the hull hardness of the Type 10. Uh, the next calculation that takes place is resistances. Uh, so the game would figure what the incoming damage archetype is and then apply the relevant uh, reduction. So in this case, more than half of any remaining damage after falloff and hole hardness would be uh, knocked off the top for thermal. Once that's done, then the game relies on another set of values. Um, but in Elite Dangerous, if you look at the module attributes in your outfitting screen, you will see a minimum breach chance and a maximum breach chance, which for the pulse laser is between 40 and 80%. So what that means is for every successful hull impact, damage calculations are applied, and any damage that is left to be applied then rolls a dice to see if it pierces the hull. Depending on where that number lands, between 40 and 80 percent, the module will calculate damage to internal, or the weapon will calculate damage to internals. Now that internal damage, if the game calculates that the shot pierced the hull, which it not, it not every shot will, uh, then the game will look at your module reinforcements. And the damage that is allowed to pierce the hull will then go through a damage check against your module reinforcement packages. In this case I have one size 5 module reinforcement. So if I'm sub-targeting with these pulse lasers, any damage impact that pierces the hull and can damage a selected internal will have 60 percent of whatever is left after all of this stuff up here is calculated knocked off the top. 40% of, of that remainder will be applied to the module I'm targeting, in this case if it were the power plant. Um, each successful hull pierce shot would probably amount to like one or two points of damage. And against a nearly 400 integrity power plant, that's not a great deal. But crucially, that 60% that isn't applied up here to the power plant or to any other internal gets applied to the module reinforcement package. So if, in theory, I had 10 DPS, I was lucky enough to get all 10 DPS applied to a specific internal, the module reinforcement package would take 6 damage, and the selected internal I was targeting would take 4 damage. Uh, now, the module reinforcement package also offers a certain amount of protection to external modules, though it is vastly reduced. Adding a second D-rated module reinforcement package gives uh, about 84% protection from incoming damage. So you're not getting 120%, you're not ever going to be able to render your internal modules immune to damage by just stacking MRPs, but you can improve the protection factor significantly. So with these two guys here, you get roughly 84% protection from incoming damage, which means that if 10 points of damage come into the power plant, only about, oh geez, with 84% protection, that's about 15% damage, that's about 1.5 damage for every 10 damage that comes in actually being applied to the power plant. But the, uh, the damage that isn't applied to the power plant would then be split between these two MRPs. So the amount of protection that you would need in a given situation changes based on what you're doing. Uh, in the case where you have uh, two module reinforcements that are 60% protection enabled, the 5Ds, um, they're going to take the same amount of damage as each other as incoming damage ticks down. Now I might... I should nuance this. I might be wrong about the specific way that damage tables are applied because most people that I know just run one MRP, but you can run more. Uh, the maximum possible protection that you can apply in a given situation, at least for uh, before diminishing returns really starts to uh, to take away incentive, is to run two D-rated and one E-rated, so two 60s and one 30, which gets you pretty close to 100% protection. And the 30 actually helps to insulate damage to the 60s, um, stretching out the lifespan of all three modules. But it should be noted that the protection ensures that, that the damage is split equally among these two. So if, for example, I undid, let me see if it'll let me undo, no it won't. If I change this back to a whole reinforcement package, and I make this guy a 60% D-rated, then as the damage gets split equally, so if we had 10 damage coming in, you know, about 1.5 goes to the power plant, and then these two guys will split the remaining damage, a little less than 5 each, this module reinforcement package is going to fail long before this one does. 
And if this one fails completely to the point where it stops working, then what ends up happening is uh, this guy takes over all of the damage absorption. And derated module reinforcement packages are typically the preferred method in PvP because they give you more protection over a shorter period of time. Um, but if you wanted to fortify this completely, then uh, what you would want to do is have two large derated hull reinforce or module reinforcement packages. So in this case, you do what I'm doing here and go um, 2D. And then you could have a similarly sized or smaller E-rated module reinforcement package to extend the protection these MRPs provide. If you have an AFM like I do, it should be noted that an AFM is far more efficient at repairing MRPs than it is at individual modules. So one thing that you can do instead of running a bunch of MRPs is to just run whole reinforcements like this and then uh, have an AFM available so that you can repair your module reinforcement package as it takes damage. Now normally uh, an AFM needs to shut down a module in order to repair it, which is really difficult when it's something like your frameshift drive or your thrusters. Uh, but your auto field maintenance unit can repair module reinforcement packages without taking away their protection. Meaning that it's basically a no-brainer and as you are taking damage in PvP you can use an AFM to periodically uh, repair your MRP and keep it working over a longer period of time. This saves weight since AFMs are uh, zero mass, but it does impart a significant power cost. And I have to make a lot of sacrifices to my Type 10 build just to fit that uh, 3B rated AFM in there. The other thing I wanted to talk about in this video is the way that you sub-target internals, because it's a very important strategy in PvP once you get a target shields down to disable them as quickly as possible. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that's why power plants are far and away the most favorite target and why everybody who does PvP seriously should be doing armored grade 5 power plants or failing that should be reinforcing the unholy crap out of your shields because if this is a weak point and your shields go down it doesn't matter what this figure is this figure is all that counts if this hits zero you're done because once your power plant integrity hits zero, every successful tick of damage to the power plant has a random roll chance of blowing your ship up. It's famously easy in combat zones to blow up Type 9s that the PvEs fly by just zipping off their shields and then pounding away at the power plant until the whole thing blows up, sometimes with as much as 80% of its hull integrity remaining. Do not neglect this module. So if you're overcharging, and that's the other popular blueprint among shield tanks, you need to have an escape plan. You should be exiting a combat environment long before that last ring of shields goes down because once it hits zero, if he's got super pen railguns, you're like two or three successful hits away from being dead in the water. Now the other thing to be considered is like everybody likes dirty drive, drag drives. Uh, if you're on a big ship that isn't maneuverable, you should be reinforced and double braced because if the other guy knows how to shoot out your drives, um, uh, drag drives are extremely fragile and it only takes a couple of successful direct hits to end a fight. In my opinion, it is worth sacrificing maneuverability on large ships in order to ensure that your thrusters can survive getting tapped on over and over by super pen railguns. Because remember, with that railgun blueprint, as long as he lines up his targeting pip with your engines, he is doing module damage. And large ships just are not they're they're actually surprisingly difficult to keep operating against a competent PvP pilot. In PvE it's not a big deal, run whatever you want. And the other thing that I always do with large ships in particular, but um, almost all of my combat ships run B-rated frameshift drives that are shielded and double braced, because when your shields go down, um, if they're not already on your power plant, they're gonna be on your frameshift drive to keep you from escaping. So I've made no compromises on reinforcing the crap out of this uh, frameshift drive so that I always have the option to escape an engagement. Combat ships should strongly consider this blueprint combination, um, but you know it's your master of your own destiny. I like to build all of my ships so that they can survive being ganked in open play. And that includes also a reinforced life support system that is at least B-rated. Um, I would go higher if you want more time but it's super helpful to not have a countdown clock to your death have you know seven or five minutes on it because that's not a lot of time to get back to a station or to manage incoming damage especially because any tick of damage that you take to shields or hull when trying to synth new life support is going to reset the synth and force you to just get stuck in your menu it's super inconvenient that's all i got for today and i will catch you guys later